Yeah, so they hacked Michelle Obama. This website is hacking everybody and their brother, uh, dumping out their financial data and other people. So it doesn't look enormously damaging so far. I don't think they've dumped out their email blogs or anything. That's what usually gets these people in trouble. But anyway, it appears to be a foreign website, exposed.su. I don't know what SU is. Soviet Union. Oh, oh, there's a lot of those. And the Soviet Union has dissolved, so these are just up for grabs now. But, so a lot of really underground sites go on SU. I think I've heard of this before. So, all right. Um, so that's where you put your website if you really don't want to deal with lawsuits or anything. Anyway, so they're dumping you know, what they can find out about people. But there is no Soviet Union. There isn't, but the SU domain still exists, and people still use it, and they mostly use it for underground purposes. And I wouldn't be surprised if anybody using an SU domain is at some risk of it vanishing or something. So I, I, I've heard of this before, that they put really dodgy sites on SU. And the really dodgy stuff is, of course, on Onion. You hide it on Tor. So that... Um, Darknets. Yeah, that's one of the... Tor is one of the more popular Darknet ones. Um, and yeah, once you can't even, that way you can have a sort of URL, but people can only access it through Tor and they can't find your servers. That's where they put stuff like kidding and stuff. Anyway, um, no, can I show you this one? Punk Spider. What, this, what these guys are doing is they're doing unauthorized vulnerability scanning of large portions of the whole internet, which is, by the way, almost certainly illegal. So I imagine this site will probably go down pretty soon. But anyway, they're doing it, and then they index the results, and that means I can view it without breaking the law. So I wondered, for example, about City College. If we have any cross-site cross scripting, SQL injection, or blind SQL injection, and the answer appears to be no, or they didn't scan us, which is possible. But and I, I didn't find much looking for domains, but if you go to name here, you can go at title, and put things up here like school, and then search. Now, cross-site scripting is relatively unimportant. SQL injection is the most important vulnerability. So here are schools with SQL injection. Some say, guys, Tom Brown's tracker school appears to have five open SQL injections. And so let's take a look. Uh, those are all the cross. Here's the SQL injection. Let's see if this is true. It's obviously an automated scanner. And like all automated scanners, the results are kind of imperfect. For example, this is not a SQL injection. This is just a runtime error. You feed it some unusual character up in the URL, and it crashes, but that's not a SQL injection. It doesn't mean you can inject code. I made that mistake before, and Dan Kaminsky said me right. So these guys may not have a real problem, but this is what happens when you run a scanner. The scanner gets a result that looks funny, and it freaks out. There's some kind of error message happen, but there's not the kind of error message that really indicates a SQL injection. That's why you have to check them um, by hand. But I think I checked this one last night with my students. I think the Canadians are really in trouble. Canadian Hockey Prep School has got a real SQL injection on their website. If you go here, this tells you you have an error in your SQL syntax. Something is wrong, your apostrophe, backslash, apostrophe, that's bad. That means this, I think at percent 27 there is an apostrophe. When you add an apostrophe, you actually broke their syntax and therefore you could put real SQL commands after that. These guys, anybody could dump out all their data, take over the server deface their web page and all that nasty stuff. So it would be friendly to warn them, and my CISSP students may be on this. Um, it's a difficult, touchy task to warn them. And when I started doing it, I actually ended up getting an official ethics complaint against me from an angry InfoSec professional, because it is considered wrong to warn people about vulnerabilities, but you have to get a contract and money from them first. Because um, what happens is, if you do what most InfoSec amateurs do, and you send them an angry letter full of calling them an idiot and evidence of, that they're vulnerable, then they accuse you of being a hacker and try to prosecute you. But I've had no trouble when I write them a very careful letter that doesn't ask for money, doesn't include a link, uh, tells them who I am, says, your site is vulnerable, you're on a list of vulnerable sites, go here and look, here's your problem, here's what you need to do to fix it. That's been relatively successful. Anyway, um, but so it's kind of interesting. You can see these sites. And one I found was game, there's few general schools. There's an awful lot of vulnerable games out there. Game Express SK in some other language. SK is what scan? South Korea. South Korea? That could be South Korea. They might have one. Now, one thing, there are quite a lot of them in foreign countries. And in general, I haven't put much effort into warning the people who don't speak English because I figure the chance of my email doing any good is very small. Um, 
but uh, that is, this is a real SQL injection. These guys are in trouble. Error in your SQL syntax, that's bad. So, StarCraft in South Korea, if anyone feels like warning GameExpress.sk, it would be nice, but you have to be careful when you warn these people. They may. Yeah, it yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. If the server administrator configures it so the server won't return any warning, any of these, is it possible? You mean to turn off the errors, yeah. the error messages. Um, I suppose it's possible, but I've never seen it done. Turning off the messages might conceal the existence of the vulnerability from people. Yeah, even if you're vulnerable, it might not be as obvious. Uh, they wouldn't be able to find out this easily. They might be able to find out another way. But yeah, that's right. It's, um, it's a good point. That's one possible solution. Of course, it'd be better to actually fix the underlying bad code, but yeah. turning off the, these, are, these are all defenses, you know? Even hiding your, your weak spots is a defense of sorts. Anyway, that's kind of fun to see. You can find vulnerable sites there, and of course, uh, uh, that's just an action that we need to happen. I mean, sooner or later they're going to get sued. You aren't allowed to do this without authorization. Viewing it is fine, but you are not allowed to scan somebody else's site for vulnerability without authorization. Um, as far as I can tell, although the, the customs on that seem to be changing, HD more is very close to doing this to the whole internet. We have Rapid7, in cooperation with law enforcement and the Interpol. Um, American and international agencies know he's doing it. And he is, and also Shodan is scanning a lot of sites, reports, and making websites. So it's, things are shifting. It is, and also taking down botnets, like executing code on other people's machines has now been approved by court order in five or six separate cases. Microsoft's done it a couple times. That's another thing you always used to say was impossible. In India, just a couple days ago, they had a new one. Again, pushing the envelope of what's legal here. Um, they had a hacking convention of some kind. I don't know what it was, something on the order of DEF CON they have over there. And they decided to have a contest to take down a botnet. And all the people at the, con at the convention hacked into a real command and control server and took it down. And that is fantastically illegal. <laughs> and these, the people, now HoneyNet has been doing this for years. HoneyNet has been resisting malware and botnets for many years. They're a very reputable organization. And they are, of course, offended mm. like anything. They participate in legal takedowns. They go, all right, what is this? You can't just take down a botnet. You have to get permission and uh, court orders and stuff. Otherwise, you're just doing illegal hacking yourself. And if you have a contest, you don't even have any control of what they're doing. You just let everybody compete to take down the server. <laughs> Is, anyway, but I, think, I do know some people in India that tell me they love India because it's legal to do hacking. Maybe it is. I think, and of course, if there's no Indian law against this, and if the server is not in India, it's essentially impossible to prosecute anybody. But if you were, if the server is in America, and you're in America, whatever India and hacked, you might get arrested when you come back to America. Anyway, so, but this is pushing the envelope. So we will find out. There are certainly a lot of people that do it. The one thing that amazed me is when Google did it, nobody even said a word about the illegality of it. Chinese hacked Google, and Google just immediately hacked them back and stole all the data back. Everybody just got article everywhere about the meaning of the data and what it all meant. Nobody seemed to care that what Google did was obviously illegal. So I'm not quite sure what to say, but as far as I can tell, there's no particular rule of law there. And of course, um, the Borders Without Borders are pointing out uh, country, countries they don't like, companies and countries that uh, surveil their people too much. Um, which is quite a lot of, here's companies that manufacture the software used by repressive governments to spy on their citizens. Yeah? About the SQL attacks. Yeah. Were you reading the, um, the URLs and that said, okay, this is not, a, and was it your knowledge of, the, of, of Linux or some programming language or the syntax of URLs that gave it away as not a SQL? Um, it's the wording of the error message itself. See, what happens is when you get an error message here, it should still be in my queue, yeah. See, when you get an error message, that means something has gone wrong. But if it's a syntax error, that means you've been able to break the formal structure of the, of the SQL command so it no longer can understand what part of it is commands and what part of it is data. And that's what you need to take to dump out all the data from server. Okay. If you have a thing that just says invalid value, that just means you put in something like an apostrophe and it says that's not a valid number, which is harmless. That means you can't view a page with an apostrophe in the URL, but it's not giving you the power to execute a command on the server. This, the critical thing is when it says it's a syntax error. 
you should, nothing you should, you should not be able to put anything up here that creates a syntax error. There's a parameter here called page, and probably it ought to be page equal one, page equal two, and if I put in something like one apostrophe, that should just be an illegal page number. There are two good ways to handle this. One is to filter out all funny characters if it's supposed to be a number, and then it will just work. I'll see page one. The other is to send me some kind of error message saying there's something wrong with your link, fix it. But what it should not do is have a syntax error. That means I'm able to manipulate the actual structure of the command, and I can inject commands here. So you put in an apostrophe, and then you say union uh, select all from table users. You just say something like this is what you put in, and you'll dump all the data from the entire database out. It really is that simple, although you have to figure out the name of that table, and you have to, uh, there's, there's some more complexity to it, and you, there's several projects in the hacking class where you do this. But the point is, if you do have a, this kind of error, then this apostrophe begins a region of active code. So instead, and everything I put here should just be the name of a page, it should be static data. That's what should happen. That's what would happen if you use parameterized queries, um, which is the best solution for me. But I mean, this, when you see this, that means they didn't. They wrote the same on syntax, see what they would learn in like a beginning class. And uh, therefore, if I start doing this, I'm committing felony. I'm not going to hit it. You're allowed to look at it and see the error and then quit. But if you start injecting commands, I'm going to be executing code on their server without permission. And that is what you're not allowed to do. But in practice, things get a little unclear as to where the law is. But anyway, the, um, and when these guys ran that scan, they effectively did that. They sent them probably hundreds of various malformed URLs to see what errors they would get. And that is something that generally considered illegal, but we will see. Anyway, um, what problems do you get from virtualization? What's that? Um, the escape. The yeah, escape, yes. That's one possibility. Um, people, this malware might escape from a virtual machine and infect other machines. What else? Single point of failure. Exactly. Yes, you can have a single point of failure if you put many VMs on one host. Yeah. And your physical data is in someone else's hands. Yes, if your virtual machine is hosted somewhere else, like Amazon. Yeah. All right. So what's the TPM? It's a coprocessor to handle encryption. Yeah, and handle encryption keys. And what's the name of it? Trusted. That's it. Trusted platform module. Good. Okay. All right. So how do you stop people from losing your company data with their iPads? Remote wipe is another one to try to reduce. Yeah, there's quite a few. Password. Those Putting a password on the device, so hopefully if, if you lose it, they can't get it's a target. They can't get the data off. Yeah. Low jack root. Yep, low jack is fine too. Same kind of thing. So if you lose it, maybe you can get it back before somebody else gets it. And at least, yeah, these are all good. It's a big issue now how to control the data on those mobile devices. All right, and what are um, some software as a service systems? Gmail. What do you have there? Yep, Hotmail, Moodle, all these things. Anything where somebody else has set up the software and you just log in and use whatever features they give you. That's software as a service. If you get to install the operating system or you get to write your own programs up there, then it's more than just software as a service. It's something like infrastructure as a service. All right, any questions about that stuff? Well, let's charge back in to chapter six, which we did not finish last time, which should be here. All right, so social engineering. Um, this has been getting bigger and bigger press at hacker conventions and in security organizations. And you know, technology, like I say, the more things change, the more they stay the same. You have all your fancy gadgets and all your email, but still, just tricking the people is the most effective way to break into places. And uh, it's hard to patch the people. So <laughs> you, you've got a problem here in that you know you have you might have long complex passwords, but your people will just hand them over. But the registry tried this. They gave people a cup of coffee for the password. Why seventy percent of people agreed to do it? So uh, there's a lot of techniques. And, and what? What's that? What did you just say about the registry tried this? It's a, a, a sort of cynical British magazine. They set up put up a booth and they gave people a free cup of coffee for their password, and they got seventy percent of people to do it. Well, that's, of course, an issue, and of course, some people will just lie about the password to get the cup of coffee, which would be a good thing, but anyway, it does show, this is a fairly common problem, that employees, this is why training your employees is so important, because they often do not understand why they are doing security things. They just think you're wasting their time, so they circumvent your security measures, whereas presumably, if you could explain why, they might be on board with it. That's why a lot of companies just require everybody to have security plus the thing you're preparing more here, to work there. So hopefully everybody understands how important security is and you don't have a bunch of people just thoughtlessly 
violating protocol property and door open and all that jazz just to make their work easier. So social engineering relies upon knowing human psychology, and this has been around forever. So it's ex it's incredible how effective this stuff is. Another related issue, I just wrote another article in 2600, they just accepted it um, for about trolls. Because the negative side of social engineering is where you decide to upset somebody with carefully chosen messages just to mess with them. And this is extremely effective on the internet and drives people to suicide, people to quit their jobs and become paranoid lunatics hiding out trying to track down the people who are oppressing them. It's that, and that's just to hurt people, which is extremely popular and shows a really dark part of human personality, that there's a sort of a, there's a sort of instinct in people to just pick one person and abuse that person to create a sort of in-group for a clique. She's here in high schools a lot. And a lot of otherwise adult people will regress to that state. Anyway, but uh, from our viewpoint here, we're more concerned with uh, the more positive side of this, where you're going to treat somebody as a way to get what you want out of them. This doesn't even have to be evil. Um, I saw a movie about Nelson Mandela, and he wanted to, you know, he had this, he was leading the black movement in South Africa to rebel against the white leaders, and when they won, they first wanted to oppress all the white people now, get all the white people out of the football team, because they were reviewing what had been done to them. And Nelson Mandela was the one that said, no, that is not going to create the society we want. We need to create a society without racism, not a society with the other kind of racism. And he made their football team stay integrated, some black and some white, and, made, and really told them, you must win a huge trophy, because if you win a trophy, that's worth more than 100 of my speeches. And that's social engineering. Knowing how to influence the hearts and minds of people, how to get, and so it's advertising. It's not always evil. But we're mostly talking about the evil parts here. Then you have to figure out what people want. You flatter them. Uh, this is extremely effective. I must say, when I was a kid, this was the standard battle of the sexes, is that the women would mostly be quiet and just get the man talking, and it's very easy to get men bragging about why, how great they are. And then you can just listen and find out what they're made of. Um, and this still works very well. Anyway, um, but it's not 100% sex linked, but of course, that's, this is the cash. This is work, that's like DEF CON three years ago. They had the social engineering contest where they would call companies and try to get them to do something stupid. And there were only five out of like 180 calls that failed, and they were all the time when you got a woman on the other end. Because it was trivial to trick the men into doing stupid things. It was very difficult to trick the women into doing stupid things. They were just more effective at picking this up. And I say, this is why we need more women in InfoSec. There are like 98% men in InfoSec, 90% or something, and that is a weakness. Because men, as a category, share certain common weaknesses. And we're not as safe as if we had more women in the ranks of the defenders to bring another perspective on matters. Anyway, so if, if somebody is proud, and they usually are, you can flatter them, you can convince them to conspire with you in something evil, that's conning. I say you can't con an honest man. This is why you get these emails saying you want to get a million dollars from Nigeria, but you have to help me smuggle it out of the country. And if you were honest, you'd say, no, I'm not going to help you smuggle anything, get lost, I'm not a crook. But most people are willing to be a crook as long as they get a cut of the peg. And then you're in the in-group. Anyway, so convincing him you're important and more authoritative. I'm in pre a meeting with the CEO, and he wants to sign this deal, but he told me I had to get the password from you first or something. Um, convince them to do something risky. Convince them to reveal something they shouldn't. You know, these are all tricks. And the other one, you just follow people into a secure area um, where somebody else opens the door, and you just go through the door before it shuts. And they may very well see you. But see, all these rely on the same thing. Humans are herd animals. We have the, just like many other herd animals, your social status is very important, what other people think of you. You don't want to get in a fight. You don't want to be disrespected. You want to be in a group. And all these rely upon manipulating that to get people to do something they don't want to do. Because most people don't really have any firm principles. They mostly just conform to their group. So if you can set a frame to say, well, this is the expected behavior in your environment, they will just do it. Anyway, um, so the main protection is educating people and making them aware of this so they're thinking about it. And if you make a company that is resistant to social engineering, you have made a sort of cold, hostile place, and you have to accept this. Where someone calls you on the phone and they say, I need something, and your first question is, well, are you authorized to have that? Who are you anyway? I'm not giving you anything until I make sure that you really are who you ought to be. So you're suddenly less friendly and open and helpful and more cold and suspicious. And that's what you need if you want to prevent your people from being social engineered as much. So um, roadware and scareware are big ones. Uh, you get this email that says, the thing pops up and says you're infected with 150 viruses. 
you better do something about it, pay us money, take those viruses off. Yeah. It's like those little pop-ups you get that yeah. annoys people like on a web browser and yeah. emails too? Yes. Yeah, you, 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 you they put them on web pages, they trick you into installing fake antivirus, it's a very common one. Phishing. You get an email that comes from somebody, and by the way, I met the guy that fights phishing at PayPal. He was my 5,000th follower on Twitter, and I put his name on there, so I met him at the airport after that. And, uh, and I said, I think about half of the phishing is PayPal. And he said, yeah, that's exactly right. Half of all the phishing emails are about PayPal. <laughs> anyway, because everybody uses PayPal. So you can just send mail to any random number of people saying, something is wrong with your PayPal account, click on this link and tell us your stuff. And people, some percentage of people will do it. Uh, that's phishing is where you send a, an email with a hook. There's a link in there. You're just trying to have any kind of blah, blah, blah to get them to click the link. And if they click the link, then you've got them. Then it text them with malware or, or otherwise does something to hurt them uh, from which you can gain. The Nigerian 419. <coughs> yeah. Question on the yeah. Are any of those sites recommended that say, because I'm not personally using it, but I know people that will click? Well, there are online virus scans that are legitimate. Trend Micro has one, I think Panda has one. So you can go to the website and in your browser run a virus scan and then it'll tell you the truth. But the ones that pop up and ask for money, those are all fake. As far as I can tell, but there's no simple rule. And in fact, the bad guys very carefully imitate the good guys. In fact, you're getting to where they have boxes that look like legitimate Microsoft Windows Defender alerts. So they work real hard to make them as identical as possible, just like all the knockoff products in China. They'll sell you Nike shoes that really look like real Nike shoes. You know? oh, yeah. they, there's a great incentive to make it. So there's no simple rule. There can't be. If there was a simple rule, the bad guys would immediately mutate to, uh, to defeat it. So the 419 scam is where they tell you there's a bunch of gold in Nigeria and we need your help to smuggle it out. An enormous number. Of, this was like the number one most profitable scam on the internet, I think, in the year 2008. They stole something like $400 million from Americans at this point. A lot of people believed it. Um, and what they'll tell you is we need your bank account number or we need like 20 bucks to bribe an official or get a license or something. And then they'll send you pictures of the gold and this guy posing by a big stack of gold. And they'll just string you along as long as possible. And many people will gradually keep sending more and more and more money until they've actually lost incredible amounts of money because they really believe this huge amount of gold is coming out of Nigeria. Man, if there's any place that is absolutely penniless on the planet, it's Nigeria. They don't have any pile of gold. Yeah. I've heard uh, like some hackers, they're trying to trick the 419 scammers into wasting so much money on them. Yeah. And they just say, no, I know this is a scam. Screw you. That's right. I've seen that. The people that mess with them back. Yes. There's also guys that mess with telemarketers. Yes. And so you, can, you can attack them back if you want to. Anyway, um, then there's all the lottery scams. You get an email that says you won the lottery. Um, oh, this reminds me. I don't know if I told you guys how to win an iPad or not. But you... <laughs> I did. I showed you. Are you coming? Yeah, yeah I, I better tell you. See, that, someone told me that I want an iPad, and they couldn't get the email through to me. So I eventually um, got it. I really got an iPad. And so you can get it. If you come to the War Drive, which is this Saturday, April 27, you can, a random War Driver will get the iPad. I, I really got the iPad. So uh, I want it just by answering a survey. I didn't do anything to earn it. Neither will you. So if you come to the war drive, some random war driver will win an iPad. But I, this is, and what's funny is, all the spam filters threw away the email. We've been sending you email after email telling you you want an iPad. Why aren't you getting it? I said, well, <laughs> there's a barracuda spam filter in the college. There's post in the Gmail, and everything, of course, goes away in the email that says you want an iPad because they know that's, that's spam. But I really want an iPad. So if you really <laughs> give someone an iPad, good luck telling them. I mean, <laughs> anyway. Uh, so what blocked it and what didn't? What's that? Did everything block it? I never found out what blocked it. They, they reached me on Twitter and said, hey, we're trying to tell you what an iPad so <laughs> They never got an email through to me until after that. Then I, you know, so I sent another one to my Gmail and it got through for some reason. But anyway, so if I win a uh, million dollars from Nigeria, I'll let you know about it. But, um, but of course, I, I see emails saying you want an iPad, you want like, well, paper mail that says you want $10,000, you just throw that stuff away. That happened to the woman that made um, the graduate. That the woman that played the old woman in the graduate, she said, it was a flop, they didn't make any money. Like five years later, they paid her $10,000 for royalties because it became a hit. And she said, I nearly threw it away because I thought it was published in a clearinghouse. Yeah. Uh, the Nigeria, yeah. uh, well, you know, they're pinless, they don't have anything, anything, but uh, 
where did they get this, you know, this wealth of seeing like they got some pretty talented people pushing this. They do, of course. These, uh, oh, you know, I think, I think they got like some people I know. Like a university or something. Uh, no, they're just. Hey. I've read, I've read articles. People have gone to Nigeria to find the people who do this, and what happens is they hang around the internet cafes, and there's sort of a club of like five or ten guys that have gotten together to do this, and they trade schemes and they refine their pitch and they mail it out to all these Americans and that's how they support their families. They're even like good honest people. They talk to them and say they go, they're even in tears when they catch them and say, I'm sorry, you feel bad, but my family is starving to death and stealing money from rich Americans is how we live. I realize you don't like it, but I gotta do this. And he's probably right. Because I read other articles that say in the capital of Nigeria, if you drive to the airport, there are just dead human bodies on the side of the road because people are so poor they die and they don't even bury them or anything. There's nobody to do anything. It's really bad there, apparently. So stealing money from rich Americans does seem like the lesser of two evils from such a vantage point, and I have to agree. <laughs> anyway, but it's, it's now a crime in Nigeria. That's the crime number. It's official offense number 419 in Nigeria. And then there's all things to tell you won the lottery. Uh, money mules are people who tell you you work at home surfing the internet, and you know, what you do is you get packages, and you forward them to somebody in Eastern Europe. And that is stuff stole, purchased from Amazon with stolen credit cards. And so they steal a bunch of credit card numbers, like apparently they just stole Michelle Obama's credit card and much more. Then they buy stuff, have it shipped. If they have it shipped directly out of the country, Amazon won't fall for it because they know that. They have it shipped to someone in America who's never been associated with this before. That would be you. You're the mule. Then you forward it to them. Then after a few months, they come arrest you for some stolen property. They just go on to the next guy and usually never even give you your cut of the pay. That's a money mule. The same thing as drug mules. They get little kids to go actually handle the drugs on the street and get arrested so that people actually breaking in the money, don't have to take that risk. Um, I had a money mule in my classes for a while. There was a guy that came around and he had some problems at college because he was kind of bad mannered because he spent a lot of his time in prison. But I didn't know this became a class. He could only show for like the first two weeks of each class and then be gone again. He kept going back to prison. I eventually found out. Anyway, um, so there's another example. There's a lot of these, um, now that there's high unemployment, a lot of people are desperate for jobs and a lot of the job offers are fake and they will just suck you into these criminal enterprises and you'll be worse off than you were having no job at all. So, uh, all right. Uh, then there's spear phishing. This is where you write a carefully targeted email to interest the people you are trying to fool. This is much more effective than, than random phishing. Random phishing is like eBay. Just send to a million people something about eBay and you know that a lot of them really have eBay accounts. But spear phishing is where you write an email that will really be of interest to the people you're targeting so if you were to send an email to City College, you'd say something like, we're closing the parking lot and assigning parking spaces, open this. Or we're, the accreditation has been denied and we're laying off staff. See the attached Word document for the list of people that are getting laid off. That would really work. People would, you, the, the same thing is always the case. I've seen gangs do it on bars. You get people emotional. And then they don't worry about security anymore. So the guys that will start a fist fight on bars so the guys that listen to the train can pick their pockets because that will distract you and you'll no longer worry about normal safety precautions. And if someone told you, here's the list of people getting fired, you'll say, wait a minute, I need to read this. I don't care about some virus warning that pops up. Anyway, that's the game. Um, all right, and this is why one reason why people get so upset when you leak just email addresses. If you leak email addresses from a company, people say it's not too dangerous, but the problem is now you can send a spear phishing email because you know those people are at that company. So you can send a much more specific email, and spear phishing has a much higher success rate. I've seen people claim it up to 20 or 30 percent success rate. Um, and whaling is the ultimate attack. This is the thing you'd be afraid of. There's a lot of movies and stuff about this. What if somebody really wanted to mess with you specifically? And they were willing to research your life and target you, you're basically toast, right? No, there's no defense against a targeted attack. And, and there are people that are rich enough that it's worth it, like the CEOs of corporations. So people actually spend the time to find out what bank they go to, what dentist they use, what car they drive, what all their relatives are, and then they can send them an email that appears to come from their relative in Florida who really is like in rehab or something and is begging for something. You can carefully make a scheme, and this is called whaling, where you choose a big fish and carefully go after it. And it's very hard to defend yourself against these things. If somebody really wants to mess with you and they're willing to devote a lot of time to researching how to mess with you, you're in big trouble. I mean, anyway, um, most of us hopefully are not important enough to attract that kind of attention. <laughs> and there's phishing, that's uh, voice over IP calls. Um, now telephone calls are free and untraceable if you make them over the internet and you can put a fake caller ID in them. So now there's all these spam telephone calls 
Um, there's one about auto insurance that keep coming through. The, and they're totally illegal. There's stiff laws against unwanted phone calls, but these guys aren't traceable just like spammers. So they flood the phone calls with that. One common trick I know um, when I was unemployed and I was looking for a job, I called one of these lines and it would just go on and on and on and on and on and on. And the trick was they were charging you long distance per minute to listen to this long, long recording going on and on about what you had to do to get a job. That's one simple version of it, but there's many versions. They somehow are hurting you. Um, I had a friend of mine who's, uh, who's old and retired. He got a call from someone who pretended to be his grandson. And then he got, eventually he got suspicious and he got, couldn't really give him his grandson's name or his location or anything, but you know, they, they tell you whatever they have to tell you to get you to do something. They follow someone through uh, into a secure area, so you ride on their ID card, that's tailgating or piggybacking. And that's the idea of church styles like we have at Barch, where there's supposedly this thing so only one person theoretically can go through at a time. Um, dumpster diving is an old-fashioned technique used by police and hackers and many other people. You go through their trash, and in the trash you find all sorts of goodies, like the discarded manuals and telephone directories and scraps of paper with passwords and bank account numbers on them and phone bills. The phone bill <coughs> is often your highest prize because then you find out what their phone company is, then you get a uniform to look like that phone person and show up with a bag of tools and they will let you go through the whole building and in the closets and pull wires out and attach hardware and everything all day long if you wear the right uniform. And you tell them you're fixing the phones. That's a really good one. Anyway, so if you shred your documents, it will help. Of course, a lot of people I've had um, tell me that this is essentially obsolete now. It's replaced by Facebook. Facebook means you don't need to trash you through your trash, just go through their Facebook page and find out everything about people's lives. Usually yeah. the most secure one is burning the documents so nobody can find it. Yeah, yeah, burning documents, shredding on site. That's why if there are two kinds. Um, Iron Mountain will come to your place and take your documents in an armored truck and take them away and shred them, but other people will actually show up with a sort of wood chipper and shred them right there before taking them away. <laughs> Maybe Iron Mountain has that service too. That's considered the most safe. It's not a small matter either. CVS got fined $2 million for discarding records of the people who got prescription drugs at the pharmacy without shredding them. And that's a violation of HIPAA. You're not allowed to expose your patient's confidential medical information without taking due precautions. So I say, impersonation is a big social engineering trick. Getting uniform of some kind, convince them that you're a repair person fixing the ducts in the building or something. Or janitor is a really good one. Worked at the city college too. There's a bunch of janitors. They come late at night, they go anywhere, they don't have a uniform or a badge or anything, so you could somehow convince people you're one of them, you could totally walk around through the whole place. And watching over somebody's shoulder, you could totally see what they're typing. It's actually very easy if you look at them and just figure out what they're typing. You can get passwords and so on that way. You can also mount little webcams that see the keyboard, that's how they get your pin at ATM. They put a, a skimmer to get the magnetic part, and they put a little camera to get the pin you typed in. Um, so privacy screens are pretty good. There's an example, I've seen people use these at conferences. These are, I was at the RSA conference years ago, and there was a guy next to me booted up a big laptop and had this bright screen, it was irritating, so he slipped this screen on, it looks like a, a screen for a window, and it focuses all the lights. You can only go to him and not to the person next to him. All it is is a bunch of little tubes. Little tiny tubes a millimeter long, so you can only see straight on. And it has two effects. It doesn't irritate the guy next to you with your light, and it also means people even a little bit off-center can't read what you're typing. That's a simple kind of privacy screen. All right, so I've got a few eye clickers about this. All right, so a countermeasure to prevent social engineering. All right, and that's training. You train your people. That's the only thing you can do, really, to people. Educate them and practice. And what you can do, by the way, is you can hire sting agents in your own company that go around trying to trick people into doing stupid things. They was just, when I worked at a phone bank for a legal company, they, lawyers, would call to find out what we were saying. Because you were supposed to say certain things and not other things. And a certain number of your callers were lawyers checking up on you. And you have to do this at your company. You have to have people going around trying to sneak in, you know, trying to trick people into handing out what they shouldn't hand out. That's the only way you can really control this. Anyway, um, all right, costume and props. What's that? All right, that's, of course, impersonation. Um, everybody knows that. This is what Captain Crunch did. John Draper, the original Captain Crunch, was a very strange guy, but he, um, he's still around. He was one of the original freakers, and he was able to sound like a telephone repairman on the phone. He could convince anybody that he was a telephone repairman. It was his particular skill in life. Anyway, um, all right, which of these is a victim? 
as the mule is in fact not a victim, although a considerable amount of mules do in fact know what they're doing, but anyway. All right, What's, which attack targets high-level executives? Oh, not there. Yes. Well, that's not a good question. Let's see if I got any better ones. Well, let's try something I didn't write. We'll go to, <laughs> we'll go to a, hopefully a higher quality set of questions here. Uh, all right, so try, uh, try number two here. It's a guy downloaded pirated software. So now what happened? They put on a Trojan. It's not a worm because worms move through network traffic or something. He installed something that claimed to be pirated software in light about what it was. That's what made it a Trojan. Let's try number six. System level access to the kernel. All right, system level processes that are modifying the kernel. That sounds like a rootkit to me. Uh, let's try number nine. Unsolicited email. All right, that's a spam filter, obviously. Yeah, we've got that. Good. You've got spyware installed. So now what? Number, number. Number 11. All right. You're going to lose confidentiality. Somebody else is going to find out stuff that's none of their business, like what you've been clicking on. Let's try 14. Okay. Your computer has been sending out email. I think the best answer here is antivirus. It's a virus that would infect you and make you send out email. Um, by the way, some antivirus software does do egress filtering. I learned this the hard way. You know, every computer ought to block outgoing email from your machine because your machine is not a web server, typically. You're, you go to a web server. Anyway, uh, and this got me. McAfee does this because I taught Cisco. And in Cisco, you set up an email server and send email inside the classroom, and this one project would never work because the email kept getting blocked. And it took me a whole semester to find out McAfee was blocking direct email sent from one of these machines which is a pretty good thing to do because normally that's not something anybody would do. You go to a website like Gmail and send email from there. There are some malware infecting some Linksys home routers and there will come a time when you have to have antivirus on your camera and your cell phone and everything else. Um, and it's already happened, but um, so far they don't put it on routers, but it probably will happen. Right now, they don't. It's not a big enough problem to justify the expense. All right, let's try this. You want to get bank account, I'm doing 16. You want to get bank account information from somebody. So what do you use? All right, phishing, we'll get it for you. You send them some kind of email, scaring them into handing over their password. All right, how about this one, 17? You're gonna attack specific employees. All right, that's spear phishing. You're targeting specific people. By the way, spam, I don't know if you mentioned it, spam is spam over instant messages. You see plenty of that too, as opposed to going over email. Anyway, um, number 19, a message from his bank phone message, I guess. So he calls back. Okay. All right. That's phishing. Voicemail phishing. All right. Uh, let's try this. 21. A person is trying to gain other authorized information. All right. That's shoulder surfing. Yep. Watching what somebody types. 